Hi there, everybody. Sophie Aldred here, aka Ace from Doctor Who, and you are listening to the Sirens of Audio podcast. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who and the audio medium. I'm Dwayne. And I'm Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day audiophiles. I was up, you were down there. Oh, I'm contrast. sorry, I'm down. It's been a bit of a down day. <laughs> uh, very good. On this episode, we are going to be sharing our recent chat with Karen Gledhill, which um, came about after the after we heard the sad news that um, Pamela Salem had passed away, we we reached out to to Karen and um, had a, had a chat with her. So uh, she had some nice things to say about Pamela, which we're going to include later. But we talked a lot about her time in Doctor Who and Big Finish. So that's coming a bit later, Philip. That'll be good. It'll be great. She was um very chatty and a lot of fun. We had yeah. we had a good yak yak with her for a long time. Not recording. Yeah, actually, we did. Yeah, that was a good one. All right. There is one thing we need to do first. Do you know what that is before I, even, before I lose my voice? No. What is it? <laughs> All right. We have to jump down the rabbit hole. Let's go. Okay. Me, me. <laughs> All right. Just to get me in the mood for this episode, uh, today I watched a couple of episodes of Remembrance of the Daleks, which obviously features Karen in her role in Doctor Who, her one and only role in Doctor Who. And I don't want to talk about Karen's part in that so much, but I want to get your your perspective on the story itself. Why do you think it's such a classic? Number one, that's the first thing, so you can start thinking about that. But I want to know, I've been in situations with kids, stepkids, I've got older kids. I've showed each one of these kids, the Seventh Doctor and Ace, and particularly Remembrance of the Daleks, and my younger kids have always gravitated to that more than anything else. They're absolutely glued to the Seventh Doctor and Ace and Remembrance of the Daleks. And I'm wondering if you have any reasons why that might be, that kids are well, so attracted to that particular pairing. Yeah, well, I certainly remember when it came out being exactly the same, because when that first episode starts, it doesn't start with the titles. It starts in space, of the Earth. I do wonder whether Russell T. Davis had that in mind when he started Rose and The Christmas Invasion yes. and other shows where he starts in Earth and zooms in. Um, it starts in a way like nothing else for Doctor Who. And as soon as the title started, we've had the, title, we've had the titles before, but once the show starts, it feels like nothing you had before. It's a whole new break. So I think it had a success. I, I mean, I, I enjoyed the first season of Sylvester. It was a bit of fun, um, but this was nothing like that. It had a totally different feel. So the, the, the two things that were well, a few things. The direction is just so fast paced and so exciting. There's stunts, there's Daleks, there's, there's soldiers being flying across junkyards. So it's got all those elements. Um, I was a fan. I'm trying to think how old I would have been. It was in, what year was it? 25th anniversary. Um, what year was it? 88 then? Yes. Be 88. Yeah. So I would have been 19 or so. So it had enough nostalgia in it in terms of, I mean, not that I saw you know, any William Hartnell or Patrick Troughton, but I knew about the start. I'd read the books. So it had all that, had all that nostalgia. So for me as an older fan, and I was, I was sort of about to, I think I was getting ready to drift off Doctor Who. I mean, it was put on a stupid, in Australia, it was put on a stupid time. It was part of the afternoon it was 5 show. 5.30, wasn't it? 5.30, afternoon show. The time actually varied every day. It wasn't consistent time. It depended on what else happened. It was hosted by someone, um, Valentine, who, who hated, hated the show. The show. <laughs> and, and made no bones about the fact he hated the show. So I was almost at the point, and they showed the first season and Remembrance, um, and then stopped. And so... I think I was probably always at the point of 19, going to university, that maybe the show I had outgrown the show. 
And the remembrance came on and it had all these subtexts of racism, um, ultimate solutions. It was just mind bogglingly good. It worked for kids because of excellent action and color and movement. It worked for older people in terms of the fans, which was nostalgia. It worked for older people in terms of themes. It just had everything. It had the whole package. And you know, Sylvester and Sophie just gelled together so well. They were just so natural. Um, it was just a breath of fresh air. And the stunts, the, the school blowing up, the glass shattering, the everything was just so good. And the music was good. Um, now it's a bit too electronic. But at the time, the music drove the action. It had some quiet bits. It, it is probably one of those few shows where everything works. And it's no wonder it's you know, always the top 10 for Doctor Who fans because it will and truly deserves to be there. So what are you, you answer your question. What, what, why do you think it works? Um, I think I was similar to you. I was probably feeling, I would have been around 15 at the time that we saw the first season of uh, Sylvester and Sylvester. And I was, I was wondering where it was going. Um, I liked bits of it at the time, but I thought it was just, yeah, I, it was going in a very funny direction to me. Now I look back on that season and I really love watching season 24 now, but the fact that they showed remembrance straight after dragon fire, mm. I think that's what saved it for me and had me just gagging for the rest of the season. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, the following year. So, um, yeah. It was it was the start of a really good couple of years for Dr. Who, and it's such a shame that it didn't continue after that because I just think from then on it just kept getting better and better right through to the end. Um, you know I'm not a huge fan of the Daleks, so the Daleks aren't a huge draw for me, but all those other elements, there was lots of nostalgia, I was listening to, to Captain Gilmore today. Did you know in in one of the in one of the early episodes, I think episode two, a couple of things I noticed in episode two that I hadn't noticed before got over my head that countermeasures is mentioned. Did you know right. that? I, I you listen do out think... for for that. It, it's yeah. counter something measures. He calls it counter intuitive measures or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. It's some kind of act of parliament that he's that, that that he's referring to. I think something along those lines, or some agency. Um, but it is it is referenced there. Uh, the other thing that I liked about it at the time and now, and something new that I picked up today. Although I think I've heard this fact before, but I think I just re remembered it by hearing it. Remembrance was the um, the TV announcement. Yeah, um, I could tell. I could tell very clearly that that was John Leeson doing that this time. Uh, did you know that? No, I don't think I did know that. Okay. I haven't looked at the credits, and if I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm positive it's John Leeson. Absolutely. 99%. Po You're going to look it up, aren't you? I am going to look it up. <laughs> Keep talking. <laughs> um, but one of the things my eight-year-old daughter kept saying to me throughout the episode, episode one, got to the finish, she's saying, who's that girl that's following the doctor? I said, that's Ace. And he, she said, no, what, who's that other girl, that creepy schoolgirl that's following her around? She keep, keeps wanting to know. And uh, so th there's elements there that are hooking the, hooking the kids in. It really tapped into that, um, well, I don't quite know how to describe it, but every time I've observed it, it really hooks into the, to the kids' imagination and they love the combination of all these elements. Kids love Daleks anyway, uh, but the Doctor, Ace, creepy little girl, all those other elements. Um, uh, it's really interesting watching the, watching my kids watch this. I'm enjoying that part of it too. Yeah, it's great joy, isn't it? And you were right. It was John Leeson. Yep, I, I thought so, it was. I'd never so picked the, up on that before. No, so the voice the voices there, Roy Skelton, as always, Royce Mills, and Brian Miller, Elizabeth Slater's husband, and John Leeson. Yes. Well, I could tell the, the Dalek that was chasing Ace through the school, that was most definitely Brian Miller. He's got a very distinctive voice. Yeah. Um, what was the other one? Royce Mills. Um, no, yeah, Royce yeah. Mills. Yeah. Yeah, he did a lot of the 80s ones, didn't he? He or all of the did. 80s ones, I think. Yeah. And, of yeah, course... Yeah, yeah. Quite, quite, quite a good acting career, actually. 
And since we're talking or thinking a lot of Pamela Salem at the moment, she was the first person we see in in the episode. So I thought that was that was nice too. I went, oh, that's the first person we see. I'd forgotten that too. Very first scene. Yes, yes. Mm. And once again, lovely performance from from Pamela. So, um, yeah, a great, great show. Looking forward to watching the rest of it with the kids tomorrow. Mm, excellent. All right. Anything else you want to say about Remembrance or have you said everything you want to say? I'm happy to say what I've said. It's, yeah, I'm sure it will come up again, no doubt, at some point. But, yeah, it, it's just a, just a show I love in every way. It's not a character I don't like in it. Um, there's lovely reveals. I mean, I, I love the Emperor reveal in the fourth episode. Um, it, 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 it's in the end, it's a bit, a bit too much. It's good as a good gap. It's a bit too much like the ending of Silver Nemesis, two, two stories later. Um, so we can see, but that's okay because they got there first. They did, they did a great job of it. Well, what the, what it got me thinking about today was I've never got round to. I've got the audio of the target novelization there i've even got the target novelization somewhere but i don't think i've ever read it right through and i know it's a little bit more i think it's a little bit more complex a little bit deeper than than the i think it's been from what i know about it it's been done really well so it's actually encouraged me to to at least dig out the audio book and have a listen to that it's it's a really that way really great book and there's a lovely scene in the first person with um, the just what's the destruction dialect called? I forgot the um, the big powerful with the cannon. Um, um it's the imperial, oh, I can't remember. No, I've got it behind me, anyhow. Um, <laughs> there's, there's a whole section where it's all in first person inside that Dalek's brain with him right. narrating what's going on and hearing him wow. the, the first voice of a Dalek. It's pretty impressive, it's very well written. Yeah, I think I'll have to get that, dig that out, and have a listen. All right, with that said, let's jump on out out of the rabbit hole and to lead us into our chat with the lovely Karen Gledhill, let's throw in a trailer for the first season of Countermeasures from Big Finish. Five, nine, five, seven, zero, nine, eight, two. Coming soon five, from Big Finish eight, Productions. Two. We all know what happened at Coal Hill. I put forward the recommendation for a special counterinsurgency group. Countermeasures. It's been a bit quiet, so Toby's got us rather marking time. Aha, my loyal team. You heard me to track down some aliens. Gilmore, there's something behind that glass breathing smoke. Someone or something is trying to contact us from whatever lies behind that threshold. Somebody stop it talking! So it is alien. Well, it looks that way. That door started swinging on its own. Who's up there? Rachel, this is poltergeist activity. (laughs) Who are you? This is your last warning. It's in here with us right now. Behind you, Sarge. No! Get out of my mind! Open fire! Five, nine, five, seven, zero, nine, eight, two, five, eight, two, two, six, two, zero, five, two. For Doctor Who's 25th anniversary, Sylvester McCoy returned for his second season, and the big hit of that year, and in fact one of the big hits of all time for classic Doctor Who, was Remembers the Daleks. One of the stars of that show is with us here today, and she would go on to those who do countermeasures. Karen Glenhill. Karen, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. It's nice to be here. Yeah, so where are we speaking to you? Where Whereabouts in the world are you at the moment? I am in Cornwall, in the southwest of England, and this is where I live, in a very, very ancient um, farmhouse. It's mostly 7th, 17th century. There's a, a one wall, which is 13th century, um, and... Uh, seven, it's, so it's mostly 17th and 18th century and it's rambling and we live on 20 acres of kind of mad land, a lot of which is just rewilded. We've got woodland and water and yeah, this is where I now what? live. I wasn't, I was, I haven't lived here forever. <laughs> that sounds amazing. And I believe you like a little bit of gardening. Uh, just a little bit. And we have, uh, we only cultivate about an acre here um but i do grow a lot of food and we have an orchard and fruit cage as well so but we don't have animals it's it, it is a farm but we don't have animals it's very steep 
as, as a lot of Cornwall is, it's extremely steep. So it's very difficult to actually cultivate a lot of it. But yeah, it's wonderful. It's a, it's a, it's a like having a, another life. So where had you lived before? London. I grew so up in what, London. So why the sea change or farm change? Uh, uh, well, I'm married to a man called Matthew and uh, we've been married for 35 years, I think now. Uh, we met when we were 22 um, and he was a doctor, psychiatrist and worked in the National Health Service for uh, all his working life. Um, but after he he started making murmurings about uh, wanting to leave London when he retired, because he's a very outdoors person, very... Um, he likes doing things and he's not really into galleries and theatre and the things that are good in London. And I said, that's fine. Uh, I don't mind moving out of London. But if we go, it has to be Cornwall because I have a lot of connections with this county. And um, my grandparents lived here. And uh, so I spent a huge amount of my childhood down here. I have cousins and an aunt and uncle who's still living here. Uh, I love Cornwall. And Cornwall has a very unique identity Um amongst all the counties in the country it, and it there's a lot of sea um Australians love it in fact a lot of people travel from Cornwall to Australia um because they don't want to be in England anymore but Australia is the closest they can get to Cornwall in terms of sort of outdoor life beaches um so there's quite a lot of crossover and the Australians come here to surf as well because the surf is great not for me but for people who you like mentioned surfing. you mentioned earlier that um you were near Bodmin Moor is that right yes Yes. So, so when I hear that name, I think of instantly, for some reason, the story Jamaica Inn. Yes. And uh, I, I love that story, and I love the different versions that have been made of it for television. Yes. Um, and I like Poldark as well. So, yeah. Uh, but I've never We're been very to much. Cornwall. That's where we are. Yeah, I've been to I've been to the UK, but I haven't been down there. So, do, do those shows represent the area very well? Absolutely. I mean, um, Jamaica Inn is not far from here. We're about ten minutes from Jamaica Inn. 15 minutes maybe. Um, I read it very recently um, and it was very evocative of the land around here. I mean, Bodmin Moor is very mystical. It uh, There was, there's a lot of evidence, in, increasing evidence as, since Daphne du Maurier wrote that book of there having been communities living on Bodmin Moor. It's, um, there's a lot of Bronze Age uh, uh, ruins, I don't know what you call them, but uh, uh, and it's being discovered all the time that there were definitely lots and lots of communities living up there, probably only in the summer months because it gets a bit wet and cold here in the winter. Uh, but it's a bit of Cornwall that people don't know because people tend to think of Cornwall as being just the coast. Um, but it's a big county and we live inland. We're about 20 minutes from the south coast here, so it's it, it's easy to get to the sea. Uh, but to find the sort of land that we wanted, we had to come inland because the coastal land isn't great for growing things. And also it's windy down here, so you don't get trees. I mean, all the trees are like that in, on the coast. They're all sort of blown. Whereas here we've got a lot of woodland, a lot of trees. Um, it's very special. It's very, very special living here. It's it's a, a huge privilege. And we've, we've integrated gradually. It's a lot of what they call blow-ins in Cornwall. Um, but because we're not a second homeowner, we actually live here. There's less hostility, I would say. Um, and we belong to the local choir and uh I do lots of we've got a we've converted a barn here for originally it was for me to do music because that's mainly what I do now but now it's a big barn a bit big just for me on my own um and we use it for concerts so we do about um six or seven concerts in the summer months here small 40 people 50 people folk music mostly but some classical and at the, this very minute my cousin who plays in a band called Archive, which is not particularly well known in this country, but is very well known in France and Spain. And he's he's an old rocker. You know, he's been doing this for 30 years. And he and his band are at this very minute <laughs> writing their new album in my piggery. Um, they're here for two weeks. Stay, we've got a holiday left as well, and they're staying there. So we have a Just whole village. Just out of curiosity, what, yes. what kind of music is it? Uh, I knew you were going to ask that, and I can't explain it. It's... Um, Music that people dance to, but it's not house music. Um, you'll have to look it up, archive. Um, <laughs> I did go to a gig recently and I managed about an hour. It's not really my I like kind of that. Music. You managed. Yes, managed. 
Um, that was a gig in London that they did. I mean, they're just they they talked yesterday about how music in the um early 80s sort of split into pop and other, and they are other. <laughs> No, other is good. That's me. That's my kind of thing. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, I'll, it's not I'll really. Look it, them up. Yeah, archive. It's it's electronic quite a lot. But then they wanted to come here because he really likes my piano, um, and he came down recently and said, "Oh, I want to bring my band here. I want to bring. We're going to go and do this. You know, we're going to come and do." Um, and then tonight, I think they're going to go to the local pub and just meet everybody, which is going to be really interesting. It's kind of the London rockers meet the Cornish farmers. You know, <laughs> I don't know how that's going to go. I said, "For goodness' sake, don't tell them you're vegan. They hate vegans down here." <laughs> <laughs> they're really dependent on people eating meat and cheese and milk so <laughs> kind of um so yeah we have a very diverse life down here and but i go to london a lot as well i play i play the accordion and well i'm jumping guns tell me ask me questions <laughs> no no can i say i play the piano accordion is it the accordion you play the piano do accordion? i do I play the piano. yeah i play the piano accordion so do i Oh, so, well, wait, what have you got? What kind have you got? I've got a t titanium, it's Italian. Oh, I... Um, so I did after eight, did after eighth grade piano accordion. Oh, so my I, goodness. Well, you're a lot better than me in that case. Well, I, I tried to get into the, our local conservatory of music school for high school, and yeah. they didn't count it as a musical instrument. <laughs> they so don't hear either, <laughs> except at the academy, the Royal Academy. You can study um, accordion at the Royal Academy, and people do. Right. I don't play to your level, okay? I have a very nice Vignoni. Oh, I don't play um, up there anymore. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Well, you probably still play better than I do. Because, did you have a free bass then? Yeah. Yeah, see, I don't have a free bass. I play. I came at it, at it from a different angle, which is that I'm a pianist and, and cellist mainly, and yeah. I played in orchestras for years and years and years. And when I was about 50, in fact, it was around about the time that we started doing countermeasures, I took up um the accordion because i'd been in a play once that uh was accompanied by accordion and i loved it and ever since then i thought when i've got time and the children are old enough um, i'm going to learn the piano accordion and i but i went in from a folk perspective and i learned uh with folk people but i have an orchestral instrument it's not free bass but i do have a, an orchestral instrument and i i play in orchestras but i play also i also play folk so oh, fantastic. yeah Wait, yeah. So let's go. Let's go back. So where where were you born and raised? Now, now, now you've moved to the beautiful corner. Where, where did you start? I was before actually you start, born. Oh, sorry. Oh, right. Before you start, sorry, I was on mute. Um, okay. I just had a I just a quick look at your brother's band. Uh, yeah. His genre my cousin, is uh, my cousin. He's my cousin. Oh, your cousin. My sorry. Yeah. Your, your, he, trip hop, electronica, progressive rock. Philip, that's me. And okay. uh, new prog, shoegaze. Okay. Yeah, so prog. Okay. If it's prog rock, that's me. I'm into it. Okay, well, you can have a look. His name is Darius Keeler. Okay, cool. He's, he's I'll the I'll definitely keyboard. check it out. Yeah, yeah, awesome. you should do. They're really, really, really nice people. Um, but they have just awful enough. music. <laughs> well, no, it's not awful music. It's just, it's not something that I'm particularly used to. So, um, did, but actually. Did you just say they haven't grown up? Yeah. You're talking to two Doctor Who fans here too. What do you? Well, think? that's also true. Yes, I know. I know. I know. I know. And actually, I'm I'm fairly childish myself, so I'm not quite sure how how that happened. But anyway, yeah. So, right, you asked me where I grew up. I was born in yeah. Windsor, in Berkshire, because yeah. my grandparents at that point lived there. My mother's parents, and they. So I think in those days, people sort of it was it's not like now um so that i think there was a maternity hospital near them in windsor so we were i don't know where we were living where my mom oh, my mom was living in london but anyway i was born in windsor and then we lived in london in north london for all my childhood moved around a bit but always in the same sort of area in north london highgate muswell hill that sort of area oh yep yep um went to school in highgate primary which is just a little local school, went to a girl, a, a girl's school for my secondary school called Camden School for Girls, which I share with Emma Thompson, amongst other people, um, and Tams and Greg and a few others who've entered this profession. Um, so I lived in London, yes, throughout my childhood uh, and was very lucky, really. I, I There were lots of things going on. And my first encounter with my mother was an actress. Or, no, my mother was a dancer. She was a ballet dancer. Um, 
and then she obviously had to stop dancing when my brother was born. He's younger than me. So she's kind of wound that up. Then she became a sort of presenter sort of model sort of person and then she eventually became an actress but not till I was about 16 I think but I remember somebody coming to my school when I was about five and she did acting with us um, which really consisted of improvising movement and uh, yeah sort of dance and things to the Nutcracker Suite I, this, I have vague memories of this. I was only about five or six and I absolutely loved it. And I think from that point on, I just decided that that's what I was going to do. Um, and everything, anything to do with acting that ever happened at school, I did. We didn't, in those days, in the 60s and 70s, there wasn't much, really much drama. There was no drama, formal drama education in school. Um, but if there was a play, I was in it um, and really wanted to be part of, of what was going on but music was much more structured so music was what I did um within the school setting that that was acceptable so I did music I played the cello in orchestras for years and years I also was very lucky I had um in London in the 70s they had the uh, in a London education authority um and they offered free music education on Saturdays uh to people who were able and um so I had free for seven years, I had free music education on Saturdays at a school in Pimlico. Oh, okay. So music, I'd say I was much more sort of keyed into music and did acting when I could. But it wasn't, it was sort of slightly frowned upon. <laughs> doing, um, I did lots of commercials with my mum when I was little because she was doing commercials at that time. Um, so, yeah, did lots of those and loved it. But but I just wanted to be an actor, really. Uh so how did that happen? How, how, how did you get into acting? Um, well, I did the sensible thing first. So I was lucky because I was I found school relatively easy. I loved school. My home life was, I'm not going to talk about it because that's too complicated, but it wasn't great. My dad left when I was very young. I had a younger brother, um, grand, wonderful grandparents, slightly complicated childhood. And my mother remarried when I was about 16 and then things sort of settled a little bit then so I was but school for me was absolutely safe structured predictable and I had a fantastic group of friends and my year group given that we all started school 50 years ago more than 50 years ago now we have a whatsapp group for my year which has over 50 people on it from my just my year at school um, and that's how connected we were then and how connected we are now and it's really quite remarkable. Uh, and we're, we've accounted for most people. There's a few that we can't find, but it, it's, it was a really, really remarkable time. And we were at a very progressive school, which was unusual. Um, no uniform, very informal, no punishment, no rules. Um, it, it was a great school. And still is a great school, actually. But it was it was in that that particular period of time, it was amazing. So then I I studied uh, A levels. I did um, amongst other things classics, and I decided that I'd I wanted to go to university. There was no such thing, and I didn't want to go to drama school. I knew I didn't want to go to drama school um, because I just didn't want to be only with other actors. Um, and. I had a choice really of applying to do English or classics. And I, I sort of thought, well, I'm going to read books for the rest of my life. Um, and I'm, if I don't do more Latin and Greek now, I'm never going to do it. So I decided to apply to do classics and I went to Cambridge. I was at Newnham College in Cambridge for three years. And although I was ostensibly studying classics, I actually did acting the entire time I was there. The music just went out the window and I did about... 25 productions in three years when I was okay. there. So it was continuous, absolutely continuous. I did manage to get a degree as well. Uh, I was very industrious. Um, and, yeah, it was a pretty intense time. But so I so I did loads and loads of acting. And then when I left, I just thought, oh, so what happens now? I, I still didn't want to go to drama school. I just couldn't, just didn't want to be around other actors all the time and nobody else, not have that <laughs> input. Um, so I just started applying for jobs and that was in the days when you needed an equity card to work. So 
the only way to get work was to apply for every theatre. You could only get equity cards through theatre, not not in television or film. So I just wrote to every theatre company, like everybody else, and every children's theatre company and everything I could think of. And they, each company had two equity cards to give out each year. Um, so I just wrote until uh, until I got one. <laughs> I got a job with a children's theatre company because of my music, ironically, all that time. So I ended up playing cello and clarinet, which I'd also kind of fiddled about with a bit, but and worked with that theatre company for nine months, which gave me my full equity card, which meant that I could then work anywhere by doing anything. And then about five years later, they abolished the need to have an equity card to work. <laughs> but it was great. It was good training. It was good yeah. training. If you can work with kids for nine months, then... Um, you can pretty much do anything. So after the children's theatre, where did you go to next? I, oh, this is really stretching it now. Okay. So I remember doing a uh, a fringe production of Macbeth with a crazy guy who I was playing Lady Macduff and he was mad and it was a very small space and he had very big weapons. And um, so that was quite a scary experience all around. But some people came to see it who were... um who I vaguely knew through the Actors' Centre, which was just emerging at that point in London as a training centre for professional actors. And I used to go there. And in fact, I worked there when I wasn't acting. I managed to get a sort of part-time job there, which I slid in and out of when I wasn't acting. And some people who I'd met there came to see me and they had just started a an actors' cooperative. I don't know whether you have those in Australia, but... Uh, it was a big movement in the early 80s and they it, it was a way of actors representing themselves, uh, each other in a group rather than going having an agent. And this really appealed to me. Anyway, they came to see it and they said, would you like to join our co-op? And um, I met them and yeah, so I joined the co-op and I'm still with that co-op. So that was in 1984. Right. Beginning of nine or 1983, it must have been, end of 1983. I got my card in uh, December 82. So that was that. And then after that, I just started doing odd bits of things. I did some kind of strange film in Wales for the Welsh Tourist Board, uh, some little bits and pieces on commercials and things like that. And then I got my first repertory job at Colchester Rep, and I did two plays there. It was in 1984. Um, and then I just carried on working in theatre for about nine years, maybe. Doing small scale, big scale, repertory, in and out, you know, whatever. It was great. So, I had a lovely time. Remembrance of the Dalits was your first big TV? Yeah, I did one before that. And I I can't remember the name of it. Um, it was directed by a guy called Bernard Rose. And Bernard also directed Paper House and Chicago Joe and the Showgirl, which I had very small parts in both of those. I was at primary school with Bernard. So that's how that worked out. He he ended up in America directing some lot of, of scary movies, horror movies, but I can't remember which ones they were. Anyway, so I had done, and it was something on the telly. Oh, I can't remember what it was called. I've probably got it written down somewhere that I did with him, but it was a tiny part. And Andrew, I met Andrew Morgan. I had met him at a workshop at the Actors Centre and I auditioned for him for something else. You, What else did he direct before Doctor Who? Can you remember? It was another um, sort of science fiction-y type thing. Gosh, my memory. I can't remember exactly what it was called. Anyway, I auditioned for that and I didn't get it. But then when Doctor Who, when when Remembrance of the Daleks, when he was casting that, he asked, I didn't audition for that. He asked me to do it on the back of this previous audition that I had done. I was lucky. You know, I played and that I was still working in theatre at that point as well. I was lucky because I kind of was suitable casting for Juve parts. And because of the equity card thing, there weren't so many of us um, competing for the roles. I mean, there were a number of people, but not it. We all kind of knew each other. Um. And there were a limited number of actors for the roles that were available, whereas now there are 
something like 65,000 people on the spotlight books here, which is just ridiculous because there's probably only a couple of thousand jobs at any one time, if that. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky because I was suitable for juve casting. So I played a lot of people, young girls who fell in love and cried and did that sort of thing quite a lot. <laughs> Can um, I just run some names by you to see yes. what that show might have been? Uh, yes. Let me have a look here. Uh, White Peak Farm, Knights no. of God, One by One. Oh, Knights of God, Knights of God. Yep. Yeah, Knights of there God go. was the one I, and I can't remember who played that role in the end, but um, she wasn't unlike me, I think. I can sort of vaguely remember, but I can't. She went out. Susanna, was it? It wasn't Susanna Hamilton, was it? I can't remember who it was, but it was somebody um, who I think was on my radar. Wow, Patrick uh, Patrick Troughton was in that show. Was he? Well, there you go. He was, he, he was, he was, he was in everything. <laughs> he, he was my doctor. I mean, he was the one I remember as a child, as a small child. So right. Shirley Stell Fox. Um, I don't know who Blair played Parker. the young Claire Parker. Oh, might, might have been Claire Parker, actually. Tennille Evans. I'm just going through. Yes, this is a names. long time ago, isn't it? <laughs> but that's, it is, that's but the connection it with Andrew. feel like it, though. <laughs> it feels like it to me. <laughs> um, so, so I was you lucky. Did, you didn't need to audition. You were just handpicked for this role, which was a, it was a very well, yeah, major role. Back, well, yeah, like, well. Yes and no. I mean, I um, it was just on the back of of having auditioned for him before, and I and also having met him in in workshop in the workshop and things. So that's sort of how things happen. It, you're much more likely to get cast. Well, I don't know how it works now, but it, knowing people is really what it's about. what it's always about. Always, always, and it just we got on really well. Andrew and I got on really well. Uh, I haven't seen him for a while, although sometimes he does come to the um, the conventions. Um, it was just luck. It was just lucky. Uh, um, and it what was the, came what was the whole experience to... like? What was that experience like? Remember Doctor Who? Yeah. Oh, it was great. It was great. Just, I mean, it, it was one continuous laughter, really. Dursley was a little more serious than... Um, than most people but working with Simon I mean he just he's just uh, very naughty and he just makes you laugh all the time um and Sylvester I mean we were all oh, Sylvester also I mean Sylvester is insane and he he really 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 didn't know what he was talking about I mean when you have uh it was quite complex that story I, I the actual I mean, dialects always puzzled me a little bit anyway. And I'm I am quite a serious person, quite an analytical person. So trying to work out combinations of time travel and Daleks and these things that two factions of Daleks and a revolution happening and yeah. And all that stuff. And and then I mean I I know that remembrance is is number seven. It was just recently voted number seven or number nine or something. Was it number nine? I In think the it was top, seven. Was, a, was it seven? In the whole like eight hundred stories that have that have been um been filmed for so I'm amazed, but I think it's partly because of the the going up the stairs thing, like the Daleks. Oh no, it's no that, I mean that was great, film. but it, it's such an amazing show in so many different ways. Well, clearly <laughs> I kind of, I'm sometimes I'm being unfamiliar with the whole sort of gamut of of, of Doctor Who. I I I'm never entirely sure why. I I think it's part. It's also because it picks up from a, an original story, doesn't it? One of the William Hartnell stories with the the. What's it, it, it's, the it's the it's the same <laughs> setting as the first story was. It's was twenty five years on, but I mean a lot of it's just the cast because the cast just look like they're having they they work so well together. There's so much chemistry between everyone. Mm -hmm. We really did. We really, did. and also because there's no kind apart from the Daleks, there's no kind of monsters in it. We're all real people. We're all, we're all sort of, I mean, even Jasmine, I mean, Jasmine, don't, I don't think works as an actor anymore, but we, she comes occasionally to conventions as well. And you think she was absolutely brilliant as that child, but it's a lot of it's in there. I mean, she didn't, she just did what she did and the rest of it is all in the effects. Um, but I'm, I'm also still friends with Terry. I mean, Terry's quite, he's getting on a little bit now as well, but I do remember being quite scared of all that gubbins that was all over his face as, as um, whatever he is, that one Davros. Um, but I just, I don't know. We had a riot and maybe that's what came through as well. We really, 
we really got on well. We really, really looked forward to going to work and couldn't believe it was work, really. I mean, just it was bonkers. It was bonkers. And that mad day down on the South Bank when they under the arches and all the Daleks. And there's only four that ever move at any one time. You know, they were these little guys in these things. The, Gal the, the Daleks, they were small, the people who had to go in the Dalek outfits. And and then there were all these, they let off all these big noises and things and they'd failed to inform the local services that this was going to happen and these fire brigade and ambulances turned up and things. I mean, it was all during the time of um, bombings, you know, IRA bombings and things. So it was, it was, <laughs> it was completely mad. The whole thing was completely mad. <laughs> I just and those crazy clothes that they put me in. I hated those clothes. There were so many brown clothes, and they wouldn't let me wear a Newnham scarf. I was a bit pissed off. About that. They made me wear the um, the Girton scarf because I had to, to have gone to Girton. And I said, "But I went to Newnham. Why can't I wear the no, no? The colours of the Girton scarf were better than the Newnham scarf." Um, so I had to wear betray my college and wear a Girton scarf and that duffel coat, which has. Haunt, it, it's kind of haunted me ever since. The duffel coat, it seems to have had a fandom and life of its own. Um, somebody even gave me one at a, a convention not so long ago because um, I said that I didn't have a duffel coat anymore and they sent me one. Mm. Um, did, you, did, you, did you have much did, to do with Jonathan Turner? No. I don't even remember meeting him, although he must have come at some point, I think. Sorry, you were going to ask something mm. as well. Just, just out of curiosity, they, they didn't have big roles. I don't think they had, they didn't have any scenes with you, but there was a couple of other really uh, legendary Doctor Who actors in there too. There was Michael Sheard, and yes. there was also uh, Peter Halliday. Did you have much to do with those? Even Peter during Halliday, no. or like that? Peter Halliday, I barely remember. Michael Sheard, yes, because I think we did work together at some point. There must have been days when it crossed over because of the location, the school location. Um, when he was, when we were killing the Daleks with the baseball bat, I think. He he had a much larger role than Peter, but Peter had sort yes. of like a cameo. Yeah. Yes. I didn't meet Peter um, on, on the actual, I don't think we rehearsed together because we weren't in scenes together. As far as I remember, yeah. we were in scenes together. No, you weren't. So, but with Michael Sheard, there must've been some sort of crossover on, on filming days. Mm. Cause we did all the, um, Location. We did all the location stuff first, and then we did the studio stuff afterwards. I think that's right. Do you have any memories of any clear memories of Michael? What he was like as a person? Oh, very nice. I mean, he was. Uh, but I'm. I also had a. He was in something else, wasn't he? He was in. Um, he'd been in in another series on the television. Range Hill was it? Range, Range Hill, Hill think, was that later? Yeah, I think it, no, that was before. And I think that Grange, I, I'm pretty sure it was before. So my associations time. of him were um, were much more to do with that, I think. So I met them. I mean, I, it's Harry Fowler was the other one. I remember having sort of a lunch or, you know, lunch breaks with George Sewell and Harry Fowler, who were also quite big names at that time. Um, but again, I don't think I had much crossover. All my filming was with Pamela, was with the six, really. That was that was nearly all our filming was together. Did you feel at the time as much of a connection between Simon, Pamela, and you? And in terms of you know, because we know later what's going to happen with the three of you, but did you feel much at the time well, I, there was a particular condition? Well, yes, in a what funny way, I think there was, and I think I kept in touch with Simon um, through all those years. So I, I don't quite know how that we were in touch and uh he was also a uh, he's a member of a charity that I eventually became a trustee of and so we were sort of uh, but but even before that I was also a member of it and so we used to meet at the AGM and things like that so we weren't like buddies but we crossed over um and if he was in a play I'd go and see him and you know so, so there was some sort of crossover but you see that after after Doctor Who, I had another year or so of working, and then I had my daughter in in nineteen ninety, my first child. So everything sort of changed after that. Um, so my life switched, and the second child I had in ninety six, and that's when things really changed. So for the first six years of having children, I carried on working, but after that, I just couldn't really. 
Um, so my contact with people changed and there, anyway, we all kept in front in touch. We were, yes, there was a chemistry. There's definitely a chemistry between me and Pamela. And I think if you've ever worked with Simon, there will always be a chemistry. He is just one of those people. I adore him. Absolutely adore him. I, I just, um, yeah, I think he's great. And I, the three of us work really, really well together. I mean, we're lucky with Hugh when he joined because that. We were you aware that at the time people were already talking about what a great spin-off series you guys no. would make? No, I had no idea about it. And I just wish it hadn't been so long that we got so old before they did it because there was no <laughs> way we could no way we could have done it on got away with it on television. But because um, I was 28, I think, when we did Remembrance. Must have been. Um and you yeah, know, yeah, you couldn't really fake that. But uh but yeah, I'd still love to do a spin-off, but I'm pretty much on my own now. I mean, Simon and Hugh are getting on a bit, and they also Hugh never stops working. Simon pretty well never stops working. Pamela has left us. So it's me, me and Soph. We could do one, couldn't we? You could. <laughs> So part of so you, you you went on more more things and more productions and things, but eventually you decided motherhood and family was going to be your priority. Yeah, I mean, I carried on doing stuff. It had to be a priority because Matthew was working. You know, there's no way he could take part time work. It just that was not never going to happen. So, um, I carried on doing a lot of things like uh, the, a lot of role play work and just stuff that I could do that fitted into having kids. I was a very dedicated mother. <laughs> I kind of got involved in lots of things. I was a school governor and, you know, just explored other areas of life. But I never stopped completely. I did Wallander. I did two, oh, yeah. three episodes of Wallander when that was on. Tiny part, but lovely. That was about, what, 12 years ago, 10 years ago, something like that. Between 10 and 12 years ago, something like that. 12 and 14 years ago. That's, with, that's with Kenneth? Yes. What's, yeah, what's, what's your what's, impression what, of Kenneth? Yeah. I loved him. <laughs> Yeah, he was very professional. I work, I mean, all my scenes were with him and very professional, just, you know. Again, it's with telly, by then, television had changed somewhat and you didn't really get much rehearsal or anything like that. So you had to know what you were doing, do what you were told and not ask questions. And that's pretty much what it was like. It, you just, you know, he, he you were cast in the role, play the role, enjoy yourself. I was flown out to Sweden three times, had a nice time, had very nice meals with people who are all dead now. <laughs> People, David Warner um, and Dudley, oh, God, what was this, Sutton. Um, and, you know, I just had a lovely time. I had a very nice time. I did what I was told, behave myself and was grateful for the work and the opportunity. Um, and, you know, maybe things will happen again as I get older. You know, there, there, are, there aren't, as I watch television and films and stuff, there aren't that many roles for women uh really still um there's not often when i when i'm watching things it's not often that i think i could have done that um sorry my cat is meowing um shh. no go away uh I, so i don't really know what i would be doing now if i was still working i can't think who who is yeah, I don't. I don't mind. I'm fine doing what I'm doing. Uh, but as I get older, maybe there will be roles. My mum is 89, and she still does the odd bit of work. So we'll just see. I'm not at all averse to going back to it, but it's just a question of of where I would fit into it now. There's so, so many how, people out there. So how did you get the core to come back to Big Finish and kind of measures? How did that happen? David rang me. And at home, David Richardson. Yeah, and he said uh, he explained who he was, and would I be interested in uh, an audio spin-off uh, from Remembrance um, with Pamela and Simon? And I said yes. So that was no hesitation. That. No, absolutely none. I mean, it sounded great. So uh, yeah, so that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> and I think at the beginning we recorded the first four in Countermeasures One and Assassination Games, but I don't think we recorded Assassination Games first. I can't actually remember. I know it went out first, but I can't remember which way around we actually recorded them. But they're all happening around about the same time. 
Um, and I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I mean, you'll know all about that work because you'll have spoken to other people who've done it. But it's all changed now. Um, but in those days, at most studios, you got really well fed. And uh, the combination of Toby doing that and his sound stuff, David producing, Ken, who is the most brilliant director, and then the four of us and a huge range of people who come in as guests on our show. I mean, it was just what is not to like? Seriously, it was great. What makes Ken the most brilliant director? Oh, we love him too. I just, I just like to hear. Oh, <laughs> he's just he's he's really astute. Um, he's, I think, I think. However, they cast it very good at casting the, the, all the roles. He's just really organised, so he know he's got exactly the the. Um, the rotor for the day. So you don't know what you're doing, but he he will, you know, he'll say, right, we're doing this. And he's got it all completely organised um, to... Yeah, he's, he's good at spreadsheets. Oh, he's really good at spreadsheets. He's quite he's quite obsessive, generally. Um, I happen to like him enormously as a person, and I think we just completely hit it off. Um, and he's very, very clear about what he wants, He's extremely kind, so he he never criticises. He just says, let's go again, and he'll say a bit of that. He's very patient because there was a lot of giggling. Because you know the way we do it is in um, booths, or you'll know all this, but I will explain it again, is that we're all in our own booths. We can't see each other. We can only hear each other, and people get very naughty when that happens. The other one who was very naughty was Adrian Lucas. He's actually also quite quite even more rude than Simon. And so you've got these earphones on and you I couldn't see anybody from my booth that I'm in, that I was always in. Um, you can't see anybody else at all. So you're just relying on this information that's coming in through your ears all the time. And we're all very busy with guns and all sorts of things going on in our little booths and jumping and hiding. And oh, there's a lot of that going on. And, um, and he's just, so he's talking to you um, and he's just really clear about what he wants. And if it's not if it's not right, um, I don't know. I just found him just so easy to work with. But he was the only one I've worked with at, at Big Finish because he directed mm. all of the countermeasure ones we did. Mm. Um, he also so, wrote. So for what me. was it? Go on. Sorry, he did write for you too, didn't he? Well, he wrote. He wrote um, my story. So in series three, for yep. unforgot what was it called? Forgotten something or other. That one. Um, and he we wrote that. Forgot one. it. We forgot it. <laughs> what's it yeah um, you know the, the one the, I mean the, the Forgotten Village that's the one and he wrote that didn't he as well as directed he did. it he did yeah yeah so he wrote my story which was great I was going to say according to the website you actually did the first two box sets before you did the Assassination Games okay so you'd actually done eight episodes before yeah. they brought in Sylvester and Sophie again I knew, um, I knew it wasn't in the right order yeah so you had the three of you who were already familiar with each other. What was it like dropping that fourth member in Hugh Ross into the group? How did how did that change the dynamic? Dynamic? Did he blend in just Completely. just as easily as the rest of you? Completely. It was as though it was as though he'd always been there. I mean, it took on a new life because I don't think we'd been aware when we did Remembrance that we were countermeasures, or you know that there was such a thing as countermeasures. I don't think it was really part on our radar. We were scientists. Simon was a a group captain person there were Daleks there was the doctor there was all this stuff going and we didn't really know it I have to say I still don't know what Sir Toby Kinsella does I I still am completely he is completely unfathomable that character I it, it's I've been as I say I've been listening starting again listening and it's completely unclear what his job is um who is a single who, servant I mean, is he is he the say the sort of I couldn't possibly comment. I mean, he does say that in one of my couldn't but, possibly comment. He's like mother in the Avengers. Is 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 that? I mean, he's just there. Yeah. And you can't tell whether he's good or bad. Even I mean, there are times. I mean, you, I know you're not, he's, the, you're not supposed to know for a while. I mean, the first two yeah. box sets, the whole thing is can we actually trust him? Because he was he was yeah. he and he played it so well and just the way. Oh. He, I mean, I'd love to how much it was in the script and how much it was him, because just the way he played lines could be read two ways. And you actually, you all the time try to think, can I trust this person or not? And yeah, it's just, 
he was a well, great I think I was all the time. Can I trust this person or not? Yeah. I had no idea. And I know that Alison didn't like him very much. You know, that there was a, because she is, uh, well, she's quite, a, she's quite a mixture of things, isn't she? But she is portrayed as being a sort of 50s, a 60s sort of feminist, um, very smart, but kind of out there, kind of, um, and very different to him and has a very different outlook. And they quite often clash over, I mean, I can imagine that if you had it in a current situation, she'd be very much the gender politics person and the person who is really got really critical if you misuse pronouns and um, all that, all that sort of thing. She that's what that's where she would be now um, in life as a young scientist. Mm. And I'm very conscious of uh, of the women of yeah women's place in society and that sort of thing but he he blended in completely i'd never met Hugh before um i think the others may have done i mean after all he is one of our most uh successful actors in the sense that he never stops working and he works in theater as well as television you know and has mm -hmm. done for many 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 years um so uh, he i but i just hadn't come across him because i hadn't been working for quite a long time i guess and i yeah but I, I, we got on really well. We made it, you know, we all laughed. We laughed. I can't, it's, it, the whole thing is just laughter, really. And they all laughed at with me. Do you know about them teasing me a lot? Has that come up in um, in any of your conversations with anybody? Oh, no one would admit they'd be teasing you. What were they doing? All the time. All the time. Uh, Ken, David, apart from Pamela, of course who would never have done that. But yeah, they were always just taking the mickey out of me. I don't know why. I think partly because I would continue to be very industrious about understanding the stories and none of the others bothered. Um, so they would always ask, well, obviously David and and Ken and the writers knew what was going on, but yeah, they were always teasing me and and just sort of taking the mickey out of me. I don't know why. Um, I, I was younger, maybe. Even at 50, I was younger than most of the others, not than Ken and... David's about my age, I think. Um, Ken is a bit younger. I don't know why. There was a culture of let's just take the Mickey out of Karen, um, <laughs> and and it is quite well known here. In in when I go to conventions, people know about it. <laughs> so I don't know what it was. I, I'm serious. I'm a serious. I mean, I'm you know, I have a sense of humour um, and I'm personable, but I'm not, but I am quite a serious person. I think they just, I wanted to not understand the story and they always thought that was incredibly funny. Um, and I was very, very committed to, to the work, incredibly committed to it and incredibly committed to making Alison, you know, after all, I was 50, in my 50s, playing a 25-year-old. I had to work at that to give her the energy um that she that she needed uh mm. yeah so well, i had to work the, uh, so after doing your two box sets they decided to for the um 50th anniversary i think it was so we'll go the right yeah. 45 yeah maybe yes yeah, 50th anniversary to um bring sylvester and um sophie in for a special story combining everyone yeah um so what was it like when sophie and sylvester appear no, well, that was that was great. I think by then, had I met up, I think I'd already done conventions by then because I didn't do any until I started countermeasures, and then they started sort of coming in. Um, I think I'd and, and anyway, I've been in touch with Sophie all the time. So seeing Sophie was not a new thing. Um, we've just done Christmas cards and various exchanges throughout the years. Um, and been to see each other and met each other's children and all that sort of thing. So, so seeing Sophie in a work context was different, but I had been in touch with her. I'd also seen Sylvester a couple of times actually, but purely on other things. I, I, I think I sang in a concert at the Union Chapel that he came to um, before Countermeasures had started. And I remember going up to him and saying, I don't know if you remember me, but bloody bloody. He said, of course I remember you. And kind of, so it wasn't like... Um, it it wasn't like we it, we hadn't all seen each other at, at all during that time, and I, I so I'm, and I'm sure the others had had some sort of contact as well. Working with them was fantastic. I mean, again, that story was completely incomprehensible. I have just listened to it again. 
completely incomprehensible, incomprehensible um, except that the light, of course, becomes important in in our story. Um, yes. And also, it, it's curiously apt kind of right now. All the conspiracy stuff that started up again during COVID and during lockdown. And there's a town not far from here um, in Devon, uh, Torquay, which is n known as the, the sort of hub of conspiracy theories in this country and there's a magazine called something like the light that is that is published there um and it's full of conspiracy theories about exactly these people who are aliens who are here running the world and for some reason bill gates is always involved in that as well i'm not sure why he gets caught up in it and the lizard people and the sort of and when all that came up during COVID, I thought, this is like an episode of countermeasures. <laughs> it's kind of, it feels like we're living. In fact, when it first started and we were all locked down and things started, I remember we all linked up, all the, the Ken and, and David and Pamela. Well, I don't think Pamela was, I think she was already a bit off the radar by then, but um, Simon and Hugh. And we, we all kind of were sending emails to each other and sort of saying, this is like being in a real life. You know, where are countermeasures when you need them? You know, it was that kind of thing. Was, we we needed us to come and sort this out and get to grips with it. You know, it's really... We, yeah, we, 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 actually, we, actually, we actually reviewed the episode a couple of months ago, part of the doctors for the 60th anniversary. I think one of the things that struck us was it starts off very much as a countermeasures episode, the first two episodes, and the, the doctor and Ace are hardly in it. And then slowly yeah. as the story progresses on yeah. they, they they get a larger and larger role yes. um so it's just this beautiful handover of you know the two yeah. the two units but they're still working together yeah yeah and it was really nice i mean it, it seemed to work absolutely fine um as a as a link between the television series and then the um and countermeasures as a as an as an entity um i thought it worked really well it was lovely working with them it was really really nice Mm. Really nice. Do you know? Do you know what made the decision to move it to the seventies? Because yeah, you know, they said Southern. And I think they just. I think they sort of ran out of um, material, really, possibly for the sixties. I think the first ones were better. Myself, um, I felt more comfortable with that era. The seventies got. A, I mean, it was funny. It was much more Starsky and Hutch. It got kind of got all yeah. not not. I mean, the the background was much more. It it went from sort of Quatermass, which uh, but which suited us very well i think also they wanted to they just wanted to explore a different background a different set of political circumstances um yeah and i think they just sort of possibly just run out of material that they felt they could explore for the 60s i mean they put us to sleep for a while didn't they yes <laughs> yeah um but we didn't know whether we'd be back at that point we didn't know whether they were going to carry on, but they gave themselves a chance. I think they were waiting to see how the sales were and whether people were still interested. Um, but I was glad they brought it back. It was very nice doing those other stories in the 70s. I haven't got to that yet in my listening. Um, and, but I do remember the background, the music changing. Suddenly we were in clubs. We were in in kind of sleazy hotels. The whole sound design Monaco. changes. Everything yes, changes. It does. It's very, very, yeah. Yeah, I, I was thinking more along the lines of it was taking me back to shows like Department S and things like that, which that. is more more early seventies, like Jason King, Peter Wingard, yes, 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 um, that kind of thing. So yes, yeah, the long was. the longer hair, <laughs> yeah, yes. quite a mess is right for the sixties, but yeah, the longer yeah. hair and Department S, yeah, kind of thing. and yeah. a bit if, more. Political. If you haven't seen Department S, you should check it out. <laughs> I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. Yeah. But the the uh, yeah, there was more. Um, Alison gets more political, um, and yeah, there were different different. Uh, I suppose I mean the advantage of writing something in with hindsight is that you you know scientifically some of the the things that have been that have come to pass, and you can put them into those um, those earlier shows with the with the audience kind of knowing, you know, thinking, oh yeah. And that, that whole idea of a computer taking up an entire room or an entire factory, you know, and now we've got them on these, you know, it's like, it, it's, uh, and I think it just, I just think it changes. It gave the writers a different, um, different opportunities, different writing opportunities. We were allowed to get a little bit older 
a little bit wiser. My regret really for Alison was that they never allowed her um, a proper relationship that worked. I kept begging them. She, <laughs> so, she was always having trouble with, with the men, wasn't she? The men, the men always. Well, what was always. spy, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. They always turned out to be bad, you know, and you could that Forgotten Village one with Jack. And you just think, oh, it's, you know, this could just work. Maybe this could just work. And he turns out to be bad as well. And you think, oh, for goodness sake, you know, has she just got really poor taste or are they just being really mean to me? They used to tease me about that as well and say, oh, we've got your nice boyfriend for the next one. And I kind of think, oh, yeah, you know, how's he going to die? Um, and they never they never came up with the goods. And I think that was a shame. Although they couldn't really settle her down, could they? I mean, what could you do? Um, I just think it would have been nice if she'd had a nice relationship at one point with somebody who was kind to her. Um, it was actually, that was very funny because when we started doing countermeasures, I was, as I say, I must have, when did it start? When did we start doing it? 2012. 12. So I was 52 when we started. And the... The first person who came was Alistair McKenzie playing Julian. And he he was the first of many young men who arrived in the green room. And, you know, you do, hello, hi, I'm Karen, I'm playing Alison. And you could see their faces going, oh. really? <laughs> really? And uh, I said, do you know the history of this show? No, no, I'm just coming. I've got the script, just reading the thing. And I'd say, okay, so this is a spin-off from something we did 25 years ago. And we are playing the same people that we played then. And then they'd sort of understand. But these poor guys, I mean, thank goodness we were all in our own booths and just doing it vocally. So they didn't have to worry too much about it. But these poor guys were having to play these sort of flirty romantic scenes with somebody who was old enough to be their mother most of the time. You know, it was kind of like, but it was fine. It works, doesn't it? Yeah. It, it works because it I'm basically quite childish. So I could still do it. I could still do it. And I'm 63 now. I could still do it. Um, if I had to, if I had to go back and play Alison, I would have no difficulty with that at all. Um, but the chaps might find it even harder if they kept bringing in younger people. Soph does it too. I mean, Sophie's a couple of years younger than me. And, um, you know, she still does it. Yeah, it's what actors do, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And we, we look older, but but... Don't say we're not. Broccoli, it's fine. Yeah, mm. and we're not older in our spirits, so mm. we're not old people. Sophie and I are, are both both women who uh, have grown up children and a grown up life outside of Doctor Who and everything else related. Uh, but we're both quite rooted in a, a much younger self. I'm about twenty three, <laughs> um, so both my children are now older than me. Which is fine. <laughs> so for Big Finish's 20th anniversary, they did six special stories. Yeah. Um, picking some of the best of everything to do to celebrate Big Finish. And, of course, Countermeasures yeah. um, was one of those stories that they chose to do. Um, yeah, which story was it? <laughs> that was the, the Split Infinity by John Dorney. Oh, yeah. So set, set in the 70s. Um, but then after the that, that, that was so yeah. popular, you came back for two more releases one with the dialects one with the mavellans um yes. just do some big invasion stuff yes um and there was a hollow king where did that fit in the hollow king was a bit earlier they release things in a different order to how they they record things so you never quite yes. know when that, that was a one-off as well there that, was all that was a king? special one-off wasn't it yeah, yeah and like like the killing of satobi too they, they, yeah, they well, that was go, i love go, that one yeah. Who killed Toby Kinsella? Yeah, I That's love right. that one. It was a nice, yeah. nice touch. So the Mavellan one, that was those weird things with the, the silver. Yes, that's right. <laughs> well done. That was the Cyril Nuri, yeah. Well, we didn't think yeah. we were going to do any more. Um, we'd been told um, that there wasn't any more uh, after one of those. I can't remember. Several times, I think. Yeah. I think we were told after the first lot, the first 16, the first four big stories, big, big series, and then maybe not. And then we did, how many, we did two or three of the next? Well, the, 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 you, you, did, you did the Who Killed T Toby's Kinsella special, which was a one-off, yeah. but then you did two yeah, series of, then you did two more box sets in the 70s, yes. followed by the Hollow King, then the special yes. in the 20th anniversary. Well, we were, and, then and then we were told that's it. And yeah. then we came back 
to do two more. Mm. And we weren't they, sure. I, I don't really know why they stopped. I, I think they probably partly stopped because of Pamela um, eventually, because I think she just may not have been well enough. She she was not well the last time, the last we did, the last ones we did, although she wasn't saying much about it. She at that point definitely had Parkinson's and I think it was probably getting harder for her to travel. Um, I think possibly Hugh was always very busy. Sam, I think might have had enough he was doing a lot of archers the archers i don't know whether you have yep. that over there but he's on the archers and i was always willing to do anything i'm always or i always am but i think also possibly it had run its course and although when you meet the fans they always say we want more and i say well you know tell them tell that to big finish but they have new projects going all the time and i think they just want to regenerate and keep keep things moving and keep having new stuff going on. Also, David has taken a backseat now as well. He's sort of semi-retired, David Richardson. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I suspect, you know, there were, so there were, things come to an end, don't they? When you're, they, they just naturally do. It's a shame that they didn't tie it up, but I suppose they never really knew whether it was going to come to an end or not. That's right. Um, so they didn't tie it up. They, um, they like, to, like to leave their options open all the time. You never know. I know. Maybe something may come back again. They might do some more. I mean, they can't now because there's no way they could do it. Without power. Can you go away? Well, no. they could definitely bring you back with, with Ace. There'd be potential there yeah. for, yeah. for that. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be great, but how they would do that, I mean, whether they can give Ace a life outside of time travel. Um, well, they have. She's in, she's in a Torchwood she, series. She's in Torchwood. So. Oh, she is in Torchwood, isn't she? Yes. Yeah. I will just say your memory of what you've done is astounding. That we yes. we speak to people all the time, <laughs> and you obviously your desire to understand what was going on has actually meant you remembered more, because we yeah. really speak to someone and we don't talk about any stories because they can't remember anything they've done or what their I characters remember, have done. I remember quite a lot of them. I remember the one with the red um, sort of spongy blobby stuff that that cloned itself because I was very fascinated by that. And um, the idea that, that, that could be could... any Doctor Who related story. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it could be, but but in this instance, it it wasn't, and um, it was one of our stories. I liked countermeasures. I I really liked the way that there was always possibly a scientific explanation, but also this alien um, element. Um, but you were never, it, we were always struggling to find a, a real scientific explanation for what was going on, um, but could never quite do it because there was there was always some slightly alien element like the red spongy stuff that cloned itself, um, the jelly, which they encapsulated in something. And I can't remember. I, I just remember that bit about it. Um, so I really liked that, that thing of it that... that uh, yeah, I took it very seriously. I do take my work very seriously. I don't just pitch up. I do try to understand what it is that we did. So I remember most of them. And I remember finding things out as well. There was one where it was the one that Celia Imry was in. And there were people down on the underground sweeping all the fluff out from, from the rails and sort of working at nights in the underground. And that was actually a thing. I think it still is a thing, actually, that they go down and clean the underground every night. It had never occurred to me that there were people who did this, that there was this... Okay, the people who went out every night. Yeah, there was whole life of stuff. So I remember that episode, that episode as well, but I can't remember the names. And I remember the Forgotten Village because... Um, well, partly because I was working with Tim Bentink, who is in The Archers. In fact, Tim has done three different, he's played three different roles in Countermeasures. But he is a very much a character actor and uh, does voices. So he was in Hollow Crown. He played my dad in Forgotten Village, which was very amusing because he's actually only about two years older than me in real life. Um, and then he was in another one as well, but I can't remember which one. Here's a little trivia for you. We had Tim on the show, and yeah. uh, he was born about 50 kilometres from where I live in Tasmania. Oh, there you go. Really? Yep. I didn't know that. He's actually well, Tasmanian they... born. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. He's a nice well, man, too. Yeah. Kevin, okay. thank you so much for all the joy you've brought to so many fans and the way oh. um, you've been able to uh, continue to encourage and then you know, make a park grow so well. 
And um, when you come to Australia to visit your brother um, <laughs> soon, uh, we look forward to seeing you in person. Oh, I'd love, yeah. I, if I come to Australia, I will definitely get in touch and uh, maybe we should make that trip. We should do before we get too old, before we get another dog. <laughs> we should come <laughs> over and do it. Um, that would be great. And thank you to the fans. For me, you know, this the fans are completely, what would I, I mean, I just don't know where I'd be without them, to be honest. I love the fan base and I love meeting everybody, so... Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. If I fail, I need someone to continue the fight. If I die, avenge me. Is that what you're saying? Let's hope it doesn't come to that. For as much as it hath pleased Almighty God of his great mercy to take unto himself the soul of our dear brother Tobias here departed. We weren't supposed to make contact until things changed. Well, things have changed. Rather drastically. The new countermeasures. Who killed Toby Kinsella? Sir Tobias Kinsella, deceased, was the head of a top secret organization tasked with the safety and security of Great Britain. Who are you three? I'm Carol Hartigan. Catherine Solomon. Captain Philip Benson, how do you do? All three died in the line of duty a few years ago. That's not the case, sir. I beg pardon? I've seen these people. At Kinsella's funeral, they're very much alive. Please! Can we have some calm? Please! Who are you people? Right now, probably the only friends you've got. I want you to find these three troublemakers, and whatever it is they're up to, I want it stopped by any means necessary. Oh, it's lovely to be back. I just wish it was under happier circumstances. Big finish. We love stories. You're enjoying this, aren't you? you beat the hell out of teaching. There you go, Philip. There was a trailer for Who Killed Toby Kinsella, uh, an excellent standalone countermeasure story if you want to get sort of the transition between the 60s and 70s. And great story, as always. All the countermeasure stories are fantastic. I think you'd agree, Philip. Yeah, and a lovely chat with Karen. Isn't she just charming? Like, so delightful. Yeah. And, I mean, I had her. I mean, so, when Sophie was out, Sophie had told us how delightful Karen was, and she was dead right. She's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So thank you very much, Karen. If you're mm. if you're listening to us now, we really appreciate that. All right. Uh, with all that said and done, let's go to a couple of recommendations. What have you been listening to, Philip? Hang on, is oh, it your st- turn? Are we going to start with me? Are we? Okay, there you go. It is your um, turn. I, well, it is your turn. After it all. is my turn. Okay, I'm going to recommend a story that's only just come out recently. It's one. Of, it's the new Master, um, but not the Master you're expecting. This is this is the Master with Eric Roberts. So it's called Master Planet of Doom. Um, so it's a few stories with uh, him and Chase Masterton as uh, Vienna Salvatore Tori. Um, I'm not sure if you've been listening to any of those stories. They've actually been, um, this is the third box set, I think. I'm pretty sure it's the third box set. It's interesting hearing these stories because they're very American. Um, I mean, of course, you know, both Eric Roberts and Chase Masterton are both American. But the whole flavor of the box set is American. It, it's much more like a Star Trek in some ways than Doctor Who. And so it really does take me a bit of a while to get my head around. Now, um, both Eric Roberts and Chase Masterson are both recorded by Jason Hay Gallery in the, in, the, in the States. The rest of the cast is all recorded back in England. In America, it's, it's recorded by Jason Hay Gallery. In England, it's, it's Barnaby Kay who's taken over. It must be very difficult to have your two leads not actually with you. I think Barnaby Kay got to act a lot of parts because of it. Um, I think he was doing a lot of the reading in. But it's fascinating in terms of how this story progresses. As I said, the feel isn't like a master story in some ways. Um, it's a very lousy rotten master um, in terms of um, there's always a bit of warmth that Joe Jacoby has and Missy has. Um, Eric Roberts hasn't got that warmth at all. And it's interesting, I mean, it's interesting. in one level, he, he plays everything on one note. And 
I was actually listening all the way through Eric Robertson's performance, and he hardly varies anything. And I think it actually works for the master, but everything is the same pitch. Like nothing changes in terms of pitching. So you may or may not like this. Um, this this is a it's worth listening to because it's interesting, but it's not fantastic. So I'm not I'm not recommending because you must go out and buy this. But if you're curious to hear um, a continuation of the master, what they've done with him, and also they bring Paul McGann in as well. Um, because it's actually an Axon story. And so the Axons you know, have a body copy of the Doctor, of course, and so um, Paul McGann gets to play a role as an Axon and get to, get to be a baddie. It's pretty fascinating. It's interesting. It's not the best thing that you're ever going to hear, but it really is an intriguing piece and worth having listened to, I think. Excellent. So what about you, Dwayne? What have you been listening to? I have been listening to an older release from Big Finish, released in t- 2016, something from the classics range and something I hadn't heard up to this point, and that is um, Mark Gatiss's, well, Mark Gatiss starring as Dracula, uh, which oh, is yeah. a, a fascinating uh, story, and it's adapted by Jonathan Barnes, who is an interesting writer because he does a lot of the classic big finish adaptations. And just like Frankenstein, where they have done it very close to the to the book they've done it and the books of those in those styles were done like lots of letters to each other dracula was the same so yeah. it's done in a very similar way as well and mark gatus as dracula is different um which is which is always interesting it's quite frightening i know he did a version of it for tv just a few years ago which i haven't seen um, but that intrigues me as well uh, because I've heard that it's quite different, quite a different take on on the books, which may be something similar to what Stephen Moffat did with Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, modernised it, I don't know. Um, as I said, I haven't seen it. But this one sticks really closely to the book. You might hear some familiar voices. Katie Manning has a part in it. Elizabeth Morton, Peter Davison's wife, has, yeah. a, has a part in it as well. And, um, yeah, it's... Very, very creepy in parts, but yeah, Mark Gatiss, he's, he does it well. He likes his horror. If you look, if you've if you've ever enjoyed the League of Gentlemen, you know that those boys like their like their horror their horror genre, and so Mark Gatiss really steps into that with uh, with Dracula. So that's what mm-hmm. I've been listening to, and I've been enjoying I it. S- yeah. I saw directed by Scott Hancock, and he really loves his horror and fear as well. So I was actually listening to something else by Scott Hancock, written and directed by him this week. I was listening to the last, ah, Dorian Gray. Um, oh, okay. For the yep. 10th anniversary. So, yeah, I listened to that. That was, that was good too. I, did, I, did, I wrote a review for that. So I sent it off to the um, Big Fish podcast. So we'll see whether it gets some um, done this week or not. <laughs> I'll have to listen to that one then, Philip. Mm. I, had a, I had a letter read last week in the email section. Did you? Yeah, about the Wendy Padbury tour. Oh, very good. Very good. And when Wendy just, she, I just got a message from Wendy before we came on saying she's finally back home after a month away. And what an amazing time she had. And, oh, um, good for yeah. you. She's home and said it's cold and she wants to come back. <laughs> yeah, very good. I've, I, I was, uh, where I am, I'm in a very remote part of Western Australia at the moment. If anyone knows the Ningaloo Coast, that's where I am speaking to you from right now at a place called Windera Bandy out in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Um, and I was just looking at the temperature today. It was 32 degrees, and I'm getting those kind of temperatures every single day. I tell you, I was thinking today I'm not looking forward to going back to Tasmania, particularly going back in July. No. Which the temperature is going to be quite quite a contrast to here. So, mm. yeah, I'm trying to make the most of it while I'm here. <laughs> I am. A little other bit of news for me was that we, I had a few of my figures fall down today, which I thought that's a bit unusual. I hope, I hope they tumbled. And I found out we had an earthquake, a mini earthquake, about three o'clock. Oh, wow. Oh, no, that's why they fell down. <laughs> Whereabouts was so, yeah. that? Uh, I'm not quite sure. Where the Off the coast somewhere? No, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. Just, it was just in the um, Winston Hills page, the number of people talk about the fact that they felt this minor tremor. So I haven't had, I haven't had a chance yeah. to go look it up because I came on with you. But I went, oh, well, that explains why my things fell down. Oh, it's not, not, well, not any really damage. I've just got to pick up all my figures again. That's why there's a blind down. A bit sad to, for himself, that Sutherman. Well, you take care of those little babies, won't you? I will do. 
All right. Lovely being in your presence again, Philip. Thanks for joining me. You too, Dwayne. Have a good week. Catch you later, everyone. Bye, everyone. This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 190, Remembrance, Countermeasures and Beyond, with our guests Karen Gledhill and your hosts, Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Theme music by Joe Kramer. More about us at sirensofaudio.com. Comment below to give us your feedback or contact us via email at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or via any one of our socials using the handle at audio sirens. Thanks for listening, audiophiles. We'll hear you next time.